Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and the Times-Picayune. My name is Perrin Keyes. I'm joined today by Reed Darcy, our young LSU football beat reporter, and also Scott Rabelais, our venerable longtime columnist. Gentlemen, uh, uh, still uh, waiting for Jaden Daniels to stop scoring and stop uh, scrambling for <laughs> 75 yards, throwing for 900 more yards, and all that jazz. Uh, they uh, obviously had a, a, a great seat to uh, quite the show that uh, Daniels and the Tigers put on Saturday night against Florida, 52-35 to 35 victory. We will get into that. And uh, many other topics as we go down the road. Gentlemen, welcome in. Hey, Perrin, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. You, you know, um, we, uh, recently we were chatting about this week and like, oh, what are we going to have to talk about and stuff? Well, <laughs> we got there's something to talk about. Yes, there's a plenty to talk about. The news yeah. fairy, the Heisman fairy, and the uh, <laughs> coaches getting fired fairy all sprinkled some dust on us. So, uh, <laughs> so we're going to be uh, off and running. We've got plenty to discuss. Uh, but first, we'll discuss a, a, a little bit of business here. We are brought to you, uh, as always, by Champion Wealth Strategies. Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Our broker-dealer is LPL, financial member FINRA, SPIC, SIPC. And as you know, investments are not FDIC insured, may lose value, and have no bank guarantee. Contact Champion Wealth Strategies and plan like a champion today. We're here uh, every every Monday and Thursday uh, on all our social channels and our YouTube channels, specifically LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can search for that on YouTube. Uh, please subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Uh, again, we are live, but if you don't catch us live, you can always catch us later on on that YouTube channel. Uh, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever uh, finer podcasts are found. Uh, please subscribe to The Advocate if you have not already and uh, stay up to date with uh, all things LSU, not just football, but obviously women's basketball, which Reed covers uh, from pillar to post, uh, LSU men's basketball, baseball, everything as we go down the road. Uh, to subscribe to The Advocate, you go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. That's theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Get a hold of our newsletter. Uh, it's an easy way to stay up with all uh, all the headlines and all our great coverage. Uh, to do that, you can excuse me. You can uh, sign up for that at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. That's theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. So uh, there was this matter of a football game that seemingly did not have a lot of drama, a lot of intrigue to it uh, when they teed it up. LSU is certainly out of the running for the SEC championship, uh, a disappointing loss to Alabama the week before. And, uh, of course, Jaden Daniels himself was in concussion protocol for, for the entire week, and so we weren't entirely sure. Looked as the week went along that it was more and more likely that he would play, but we weren't, weren't entirely sure until maybe uh, maybe even that day. It, uh, it was very, very clear by then, though, that he was going to play, and play he did. LSU finishes with 701 yards from scrimmage. Jaden Daniels himself, 17-26. 372 yards, three passing touchdowns, 12 carries, 234 yards, two rushing touchdowns. Gentlemen, uh, we will get into this, whether it's the greatest, whether it's not the greatest, where he stands with the Heisman race and all that jazz. Uh, but, Rab, I will just put it to you first. What, what stood out to you the most? I mean, we're sitting there watching this thing. Just Every time he makes a play, it's more breathtaking than the last one. Anything you want to just sort of open up with about what you saw on Saturday? Well, first of all, that you know, as you said, we, we got an idea as the week went on that he was likely to play. But you're wondering how how effective is he going to be? Is he going to be limited somewhat? Are they going to maybe, as I I think I said on our previous podcast, do they maybe limit the t times where you want want him to run designed running plays? And he looked uh, fine. Maybe the first drive, you know, <laughs> the first drive they got to into like a, a third and nine, and then then they took off and they, they ended up scoring a touchdown. But he was just uh, tremendous from from the outset. And, and look, uh, let's say from the top, Florida doesn't have a great defense either. Okay, no. But you still got to still he did something never before done in college football history. The first player in FBS, FBS history with more than 350 passing and more than 200 rushing in the same game. And, uh, you, you know, when you do something that unprecedented, that remarkable, it, it's worth worth mentioning and, and worth, you know, lauding. And uh, he, he was just tremendous. I, I think the thing that, you know, yeah, I'm struck by two things. One, that he's become such a good deep passer. 
you know, throwing these long plays. And two, uh, you know, he just runs, just glides over the grass. And look, we're, we're going to get into his Heisman candidacy and all that stuff. There was a sequence in the game when he threw a 41-yard pass to Brian Thomas on the, along the Florida sideline. Then he ran for 38 yards on the next play. There's no one else in college football who can do that to that degree that, that Jaden Daniels does. And so um, it, it was just remarkable. Like These are the moments you, in your career as, as a sports writer that you, 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 you kind of live for, You know that sure. you so, see something that you've never seen before. You see something historic. And as I delivered on both counts uh, Saturday night. It was it was utterly an utterly remarkable performance. Uh, to to me, the 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 one sort of stretch that stands out, not necessarily because, hey, these plays were better than these other players or what, plays or whatever, but you know LSU really <laughs> put themselves in a spot. I'll put it to you like that. They they fall behind, and then Caleb Jackson, God bless him, he, he muffs the kickoff. Next thing you know, they're down, and. You know, look, we've seen, you know, what's happened this year. LSU has not, not always been able to, frankly, stop anybody, uh, despite Jaden Daniels's and, and the rest of the offense's best effort to sort of keep them going and keep them in it, keep them in a, a high-scoring affair. Sometimes you fall behind and you just can't catch up, and that was certainly the case in some of the other losses that LSU had. Um, no problem. No problem. Jaden Daniels just, you know, makes breathtaking play after breathtaking play. And the next thing you know it, they're not only ahead, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're going to put it away pretty comfortably. Read anything that, that stood out to you among, among so many great plays that Jaden Daniels made on Saturday. Anything that stood out to you in particular? Well, I think, if you, I think if you zoom out, I think, you know, this is sort of the third sort of big moment that Jaden has had this season. If, if you look back, the Missouri game where he, he got hurt and then had that huge run into the end zone. Mm. And then if you look at the Alabama game, the last drive – before halftime um, that, that was special from him and now this game against Florida best game of his career and as far as I'm concerned right up there with anything Joe Burrow did um, we can talk about if, if it was the you know the sort of the best performance in LSU history or whatever but I think I mean that was special man that was that was really cool and, and if you just look at just how much he's improved I think that's what just sticks out to me the most looking back at where he was at the start of last year, at the middle of last year, he threw for 85 yards against Auburn. People were that's right. People were getting really <laughs> frustrated that he wasn't going through his reads. He wasn't he he wasn't finding receivers open down the field. He was taken off too quickly, and now he's just totally in control, in command, poised. He goes through his progressions. He and his accuracy on deep balls is just unreal. And, and when you combine that with his ability to rush and scramble with his legs you've got a special quarterback and a guy who i think is indisputably now the second best quarterback in lsu history um so just zooming out and just looking at how he's progressed over last season and the, the sort of moments along the way of this season where he's turned into you know, i guess the best quarterback in the country it's really cool just to see how he's developed okay well so so you you brought up the second best quarterback in in school history um this night and rav you discussed this we 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 knew we would bring this up as a topic i don't know how you can't was this the greatest night an lsu quarterback has ever had you know, it, it's, it's purely subjective. The, the numbers say yes. Obviously, it was the most total offense uh, anyone's ever had in an SEC game, much less in an, an LSU game. Uh, I wrote down some other great moments that, that I you know, recall. And you have to consider the, the opponent. You know, Florida came in here 5-4, uh, yes. you know, and four, and obviously it's far from a vintage Florida team. Uh, so, so you think of some of the games that that, are, that I, I think that really stand out. Of course, Rohan Davey threw for 540 yards against Alabama in 2001. Didn't have any rushing yards. Uh, no net right. rushing yards. Right. So Rohan, you know, he he didn't he he just was a pocket passer. Mm -hmm. So he was not willing to beat you with his legs. Uh, Joe Burrow against Oklahoma. That's that's still probably a top for me. You know, 493 yards passing, 514 total offense, right. eight total touchdowns, and you consider the opponent and and the and the and the situation. Yeah, you know, the the national semifinals in the in the Peach Bowl. Uh, that that that's still probably the top. Joe also had 49 against Ole Miss, 515 total yards. Uh, the Texas game, which was Joe's first yes. really Heisman State coming out party. Yeah, yeah, 471 passing, 479 total. And then, uh, of course, against Clemson, after a slow start, 463 passing, 521 uh, total yards. So those are some of the greatest games. And I, I would be remiss not to mention Miles Brennan's game at Missouri. They lost the game in yeah. 2020. But he's playing most of this game with this, this, this you know, terrible injury that we didn't know about at the time. You know, this, this torn you know, muscle in his chest. And he threw for 
threw for 430 yards yes. in that game. Yes. And that, that was one of the more heroic performances. That was that was the moment when you suspected, well, okay, it looks like they've got a quarterback who's mm-hmm. more than more than worthy of filling Joe Burrow's yeah. shoes. And, and, and then we'll this never happens. know. Yeah, yeah we'll never <laughs> yeah, we'll know. Never, you... Yeah, unfortunately. But it's it's right up there with, with, with the greatest performances, I, I, I would say. And, uh, you know, the comparisons to Joe will – Will continue and 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 should you know because and I I said earlier this is kind of uh, I thought it was kind of a hindrance to Jaden's Heisman candidacy that people are going to compare him to Joe he's not Joe Burrow and now you're going well is he (laughs) (laughs) I'll give you I'll give you this this stat Jaden is averaging 408.2 yards per game total offense Joe averaged 402.6 and that's an SEC record so. for yards per game in a season. Now, Joe Burrow, they played 15 games against, I think, seven ranked opponents. They played, they beat the preseason top four, and, and you know, LSU is one in two or one in three against ranked teams this year. So, you know, it's, and it, the com- it, it's yeah, not the same. You mentioned the competition stiffer, and yeah. two, let's just not forget, Jaden, to take nothing away from the season Jaden's had, it's been one of the best of all time. He's got, at the moment, 3,164 3, passing yards, 30 touchdowns, four interceptions. Joe Burrow, and I understand... You know, a few games left to go, and Joe played more and all that. But Joe fin- didn't he finish with fifty six hundred something like that? Fifty six hundred passing yards, sixty touchdowns, and six interceptions. Six, like right at six thousand yards so, total offense. I mean, that's touchdowns. that is a lot, and as, and that really does speak to what an incredible year he had. If it's it, it shouldn't be easy for easy easy to forget, but it's definitely uh, worth mentioning again. Uh, Read any other any other g- performances by an LSU quarterback uh, that that. Compare favorably to this one that we saw on Saturday. Uh, I think when Rad mentioned the Joe Burrow Peach Bowl game, yep. that, that was the first one that came that came to mind for me. You know, finding Justin Jefferson what was it four touchdowns or whatever yep. in, in the first half and just blowing Oklahoma out the water. Get, given the stakes of that game, it was a playoff game, trip to the national championship on the line. I think that's that's the best quarterback performance in LSU history. Um, you know, Jaden Jaden was fantastic, but the stakes here against Florida were, were much lower, obviously. So I, I think it's it's right up there not to take anything from Jaden. But, um, you know, the, the fact that he's in this conversation, like we even have in this conversation of bringing his name up alongside that Joe Burrow, enough. right? that says plenty about how much he's improved from the time he first got to LSU. Oh, but, and what you can say in his on his behalf is that there's never been a run-pass threat like him. You know, yeah. I mean, he's about to he's he's got nine eighteen rushing for the season. So you would think against Georgia State Saturday, he's got a chance to go over a thousand yards rushing the season. So three thousand yards passing and a thousand yards rushing. I don't know how many people have done it, but it's, it's a well, rare feat. Three thousand with a distinct possibility. It's it's uh, it's not a probability. Uh, it's more unlikely unlikely than likely. But he saw the shot to get to four thousand uh, yards passing. You talk about four thousand yards passing and a thousand rushing. That's that's quite a bit. I, I I happen to agree with you two gentlemen. I, my first thought, uh, in terms of the greatest game that a quarterback, LSU quarterback, has ever played, uh, my first thought was, hey, the Alabama game that Joe Burrow played up in Tuscaloosa in 2019. Uh, but certainly that was, I mean, you know, you weren't going to win that game without him. But by the same token, that you know, Clyde edwards Elair had the game of his life, and you had certainly. You know, you had, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the Patrick Queen interception that he took, you know, right before halftime. And there were so many, so many that, that you hate to call it a total team effort because, you, you know, they weren't going to do anything without Joe. But uh, I, I, I thought about that first. And the more I thought about it, I had sort of it's, it's amazing to say this, but I'd sort of forgotten about that Oklahoma game and just how incredible he was. That, that was going to be a game that if they needed to score 80 points. Had they needed to score 80 points, they could have scored 80 points. I mean, there was no stopping those guys. I've never, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, Rad, but I don't, I don't know that I've ever seen an effect as explosive a single half as those guys oh, were yeah. in the first half. No. It was incredible. It was, inc- it was yeah. incredible. It was, I mean, it was almost comical. So, um, nonetheless, uh, Jaden Daniels has acquitted himself more than more than admirably uh, this entire season. As you guys mentioned, his deep ball is just so much is so much better than uh, than it's ever been. He's beating everybody with his smarts and with his reads. Um, he's exceptional and has, and has made exceptional leaps and bounds in that area. And then, of course, his feet are still uh, as deadly as ever, which leads us to where he stands now in the Heisman race. Gentlemen, I've, I've said uh, last week on this on this very podcast that I thought he was done 
um, in terms of a realistic shot at winning the Heisman. Maybe he makes it to New York. Maybe he doesn't. Well, now, uh, depending on where you shop, and in this case, we're shopping at Caesars, Bo Nix is minus 110. He's the favorite right now. Michael Penix is plus 290. He's second. And Jaden Daniels is plus 425. Rab, I know you discussed this uh, um, yeah, not only on Saturday night, but then again Sunday, and now we will discuss it again, about how he really is actually, in so many cases and in so many years, you really do have to be part of a championship-winning team or part of a, cont- a, t- a title contender to be in the Heisman race. There have been exceptions, and this is starting to look like maybe it is one of those years where it can be an exception. I'm not going to say he's going to win, and he's obviously not the favorite yet, but it seems as though people are starting to sort of talk. The, the buzz is starting to build about, well, maybe he can do this because people really are taking notice and say, hey, man, don't discount this guy. Yeah, I mean, it has to be exceptional because it's look, it's become it's become an award that's almost exclusively for for quarterbacks. When I was when I was a young kid, it was almost exclusively for running backs. Sure, uh, and and no one else could win it. And of course, people then, then you know you have a Charles Woodson comes along or something like that, or you know a Desmond Howard or so, you know you start to get you know a few people like that. But it's mostly for quarterbacks and quarterbacks on championship teams. There have been exceptions to the rule. Tim Tebow in 2007 comes to mind. That was his year sandwiched between the, their two national championships in that three year span. Uh, Robert Griffith III at Baylor in 2011, uh, Lamar Jackson, who else you beat in the in the the Capital One Bowl that that year in 2016, uh, just pounded him into the turf. Poor guy, I still get, I started feeling bad for him. <laughs> Eight sacks, okay, just couldn't get away from the LSU pass rush. He got roughed up on some yeah. scrambles too. Yeah, uh, but uh, he was uh, he was 19 when he won the Heisman. Yeah. That, that year. Yep. Um, and uh, you know he was uh, a great you know dual threat quarterback as well, and and, and just uh, you know you know played for a team that that had, had three losses, and 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 just last year Caleb Williams they lost three three games. The third loss came to Tulane in the Cotton Bowl for USC, but you know they they weren't you know, they weren't in the playoff or, or in the national championship hunt as it, as it turned out, but he, but he won it because. You know, based on his uh, on his play and, and his ability, but lot, as I've said o- over and over again, there's a lot of voters where they admit, and there's over 900 voters in the country. Um, there's a lot of voters where they want to admit it or not, they want to vote for the best player on the best team, and that's not Jaden Daniels. Mm-hmm. That, that that cannot be Jaden Daniels, mm-hmm. right? Because LSU is not the best team; it doesn't have a chance to be the best team. But if they really sit down and look at it, you know. Um, you know, the, you, know, Reed, you know, Reed sent me a, a, a tweet from Chris Felica, who used to be with ESPN, the Bear, and now he's yes. with Fox. And he's got more yards and more touchdowns than than a lot of like a lot of teams yes. in, in the country. Like eighty, yeah, 80 more than 80, around eighty, around eighty. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's just and and Chris Felica said if if he's not the Heisman winner, what are we doing? And Brian Kelly said it. Is it a popularity contest or is it going to the best player? And he's of course he's he's, he's stumping for his guy. He's stumping but. for his guy as he. Sh- as he should. And, and let me stop to say those three names you mentioned, <laughs> all transfer quarterbacks, obviously, when they were at, when, when P- Penix was at Indiana and when Bo Nix was at Auburn, when Gene Daniels at Arizona State, <laughs> I think you could, it would be nice to yeah. put a bet, say, I, one of these three guys is going to win a Heisman uh, in 2023. Can you imagine the, the odds you could have gotten oh, on those three guys? I, listen, it's funny because, I mean, this tells you how long Jaden Daniels has been around. We, as you know, back on the desk, when we were back here on the desk here at Advocate World Headquarters, you know, sort of, as they say, putting the paper to bed uh, Mm -hmm. on a Saturday night, you know, of course, we've got Pac-12 after dark going. And I remember when he came in as a true freshman and he was as fast as any quarterback. Speaking of Daniels, he was as fast as any quarterback as I can recall. But I just remember thinking, man, they're going to break this guy in half because he looks so skinny. <laughs> and he didn't. I mean, here we are talking about the same thing again. Didn't like. Didn't seem as though he was a polished quarterback, a polished passer. He did not throw the ball downfield very well, and he sort of took off. You know, again, what was the book on this guy? He took off after the first read. If it wasn't there, he was going to go. Uh, yeah, Bo Nix. I mean, especially if you're an LSU football fan, you you remember Bo Nix, who was very, very up and down. He had his great. We saw we saw a really good game by him in Tiger Stadium yes. on the way out. 
Uh, and then he just, you know, there were games where he just didn't, he didn't particularly deliver. So, um, and then of course, Michael Penix, I, I, I will push back on the people who say, oh, he didn't do anything in Indiana. They had a really good, uh, in the COVID year, they had a really, really good season. They upset Penn State, I think, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Uh, and he played, he played exceptional that season. Uh, but to say, did anybody see this coming? He, you know, him just going nuts at Washington. I'd be lying if I said I saw that. I'm still waiting on Bo Nix to have a Bo Nix Auburn kind of game. <laughs> well, I, listen, that, that, that may come. Well, let's let's look. Let's talk about it. Let's 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 go up and down. Sort of what what's coming next. And this is why I think Jaden Daniels. This is part of why I think Jaden Daniels is still going to have an uphill climb. He's obviously got Georgia State next. He God only knows what he may may or may not do to that defense. Um, and then he's got Texas A and M, which is we'll get to Texas A and M and Jimbo Fisher later. Uh, so those are two games where he can put up some uh, some pretty uh, has a potential to put up some pretty crazy numbers. Bo Nix this week at Arizona State, not a very not a very good team. Three and seven, eighth in the Pac-12. They did give Washington a fight up in Seattle uh, last month. Uh, then he's got to go to Oregon State. Or excuse me, they play home against Oregon State in what they used to call the Civil War. I don't remember what they call it now, but. Uh, Oregon State's number two. disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> they don't the Civil War anymore. Um, yes, they're going to have a stern disagreement in Eugene. Um, and they, listen, it's going to be more stern than usual because Oregon State oh, Oregon and State's Washington good. State yeah. Yeah. are none too thrilled with their with their lot in life right now with all these uh, with all these that's teams true. in the Pac-12 that's leaving and the conference to dissolve. Oregon State's going to have something for everybody coming down to, coming down to the end of the end of the season. Uh, Oregon State's eight and two. They're third in the Pac-12, and if they Listen, if Oregon State wins out, they're going to be in the Pac-12 championship, and that's that can throw a wrench into the Heisman race as well. So Another transfer quarterback who's playing well. That's exactly DJ yeah, DJ Uyunglele. DJ Uyunglele. Um, so we and then of course, uh, if Oregon uh, gets past Oregon State, they'll play in the in the Pac-12 title game. Michael Penix from Washington. Uh, his next three games: number one at Oregon State. Uh, it's going to be in Corvallis, and I'm, as I, as we discussed. Uh, the Beavers are going to have something for everybody, you know, going down the stretch. Uh, they play Washington, Washington then plays Washington State in the Apple Cup. Not very good. Uh, but then they'll get the Pac-12 championship game. This, the reason I bring this up, all this stuff up, is, of course, we're handi- handicapping the Heisman race. Um, but the big thing is, first and foremost, these guys are going to play some— Penix and Knicks are both going to play some relatively formidable competition. They have a chance to put up big numbers. Now they have a chance to lose, and that's a very distinct possibility, and that could then throw another wrench into the Heisman race. But then also they're going to play the, the Pac-12 championship game, and if if things stand if things finish the way they stand now, it would be Oregon versus Washington in the Pac-12 championship game. I know that game's on a Friday because the Pac-12 does weird stuff. Uh, every other year they play the championship game. Well, <laughs> full, uh, not next uh, year. Until, until they go out of business, they've been playing. Uh, <laughs> they've been playing every year the the championship game. One year it's on a Friday. The next day, the next year it's on a Saturday. And so this is a Friday. It's going to be a Friday night Pac-12 championship game. But everybody's going to be watching that game. Everybody will be, at the very least be paying some attention to that game. And I think that really set that sets up in my mind the ultimate spotlight game for what what is now the number one and number two Heisman candidate. Um, and so I, I think it's, it, it sets the stage for a grand duel between these two front runners and whoever has a better game and wins, most importantly, I think that's, that, that is going to give them so much of an advantage because that week LSU's out of the running for the SAC championship and Jaden Daniels will be sort of in the clubhouse. Um, so I, I, I do. I think I think J.D. Daniels is going to have an uphill climb. Now, Rab, you can go back and say that there are several of these quarterbacks who did play on three lost teams, who did make an, the only one though that w- that uh, wasn't playing on championship weekend was Lamar Jackson. He had he had actually pay, he had he had built such an insurmountable lead. I think that it didn't matter that they didn't play Tebow in the ACC Tebow championship. Tebow wasn't playing. I'm sorry? LSU beat Tennessee in the oh, that's ACC right. championship. No, you got me there. Yeah, yeah. Tebow, Tebow was not playing. He had something to call. He had a very quick line that his supporters could throw out ASAP that was very succinct and very uh, useful, which was he became that year the first quarterback to throw for 20 touchdowns and run for 20 touchdowns in a single season. So, um, But Lamar Jackson had, had put on quite a show 
uh, that year, 2016. I remember early in that season, they had an 11 a.m. Kick, uh, kick against Florida State. And guys, when I tell you that he absolutely tore them up, <laughs> they won something like 63 to 20. And from then on, I think it was his to lose. But anyway, I just, I, you know what? I'll tell you what, I'll stop talking and say, and just ask you, Reed, I'll put it to you. What do you think has to happen, not only with Jaden? going down the stretch here, but also with the other two candidates uh, in terms of his ability to sort of climb toward the top. I think if the other two candidates, Bo Nix, uh, Michael Penix, I think if they, even if they win, either one of them wins the Pac-12 championship, I think if they put up decent numbers, okay numbers, then Jaden might slide in and get it because the numbers that Jaden's putting up are just crazy impressive. We've never seen anything like it before. And, and Rab, like you mentioned if it's become a quarterback award, you know, wh whether that's fair or not is a separate conversation. Mm -hmm. But if it's become a quarterback award, wins are not a quarterback stat. There's a lot a lot of factors go into winning. And I don't think it's fully fair to penalize Jaden for at least two of LSU's losses, uh, Ole Miss and Alabama, because of how poorly his, his defense played. So I think if you just take the wins out of the equation and just put them in a vacuum and say, who's the best quarterback and who has been the best quarterback this season. Uh, I think, I think that's Jaden, you know, we're, we're kind of biased. We watch him play every week. We're around him every week, but Jaden's the best quarterback of those three guys. Um, and especially JJ McCarthy. I mean, uh, Michigan beat Penn state this weekend. He threw eight passes. He's out of the run. He's out of the running. I, I think so. It, it's sort of a three man race. Maybe Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison. He some, he, he's going to get some support but, because he plays on and he, maybe and, the, the, right. the, the, the CFP number one. Right? And I, that's one, another one of those showcase games. It, it was my opinion that Charles Woodson in 1997, which was the first year you voted for the Heisman, mm -hmm. Uh, and you voted for Woodson. I did vote yes. for Woodson over uh, Manning. I, yes. It was my opinion that he won that Heisman. He had a he had a tremendous game against Michigan State, but then he sort of clinched it against Ohio State. He had a uh, great game on defense, and then ran uh, ran back a punt for a touchdown. And that was that was everything that somebody needed to see. Marvin Harrison could do something similar in that you know in what is arguably the biggest game of the year in college football. Uh, if he goes off against Michigan, certainly maybe he can sort of climb back into the running. But for now, it's these three quarterbacks. It's going to so take something special from Marvin Harrison for a receiver oh, to win. Oh, very, very, something very special. Super special, yes. like Devontae Smith level special from 2020. Yes, that's right. I agree. Rap? Um, you know, you're right. Jaden is at a disadvantage. He's a fascinating candidate because he, he, there's all these pluses and minuses right. for if him. He, if we're talking about numbers, he's put up the best yeah, numbers. He's put up the best numbers. ESPN's uh, QBR rating, he's number one in that too. And like six points ahead of somebody like, like Bo Nix, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in like the raw numbers, you know, and he's, he's, and of course, he's he's the dual threat that that nobody else is. He can capture your imagination that way. He's a he's likable, you know. I would yeah. say, you know, he's he's someone who, you know, he comes off very well. He he came up. If you saw the, the his problem is you got to go kind of go searching for for the that you really got to think about it. You know, if you just have a knee jerk reaction, ah, vote for the guy who wins the Pac-12 championship game. Then, well, then you know it, the, the you're not gonna pick him and again it's one two and three you vote first second third on the heisman you don't just vote for one person um but uh if you really look at it and say you know god he has had you mentioned it earlier in the game when they fall behind after the botched kickoff by caleb jackson he has played with so much pressure to try to keep lsu in these games because the defense has been so bad he's yes. got to be pretty much flawless yeah and yeah they, they just have no margin for error and unfortunately for him, two of the biggest showcases are games. One, he got hurt against Alabama and didn't play the fourth quarter. And two, the Florida State game, he kind of got outplayed by Jordan Travis. You know, he still threw. For, he still had like 400 that, yards. That was offense. the one game where you can say he got outplayed. Yeah, by the, but by the he, opposing quarterback. he only threw the one touchdown to Brian Thomas at the end of the game when it was already decided and, and stuff like that. But again, the thing, things got away from LSU, and it's, it wasn't just on him. Um, you said Washington and Oregon. I'd say Oregon. Washington also plays. Plays Oregon State. Washington has they play at Oregon State, State this thing. weekend, yeah. and then they finish up at the Apple. I, Cup. I'm amused because I, so I looked up on my phone earlier. I'm, a, I'm amused by something that Oregon State could pay LSU back for for uh, for 1962. Uh, in 1962, <laughs> Terry Baker won no, the yeah. Heisman at Oregon State, and a lot of people thought it should have been Jerry Stovall. Right, he who, had the better numbers. He, Jerry had the better numbers, but it was like 
oh, here's another team. And the, 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 the kind of consensus was a lot of voters back then were like, ah, Billy Cannon just won it three years ago. And, uh, you know, Jerry Stovall is widely regarded as one of the best runner-ups ever for the Heisman Trophy. Mm-hmm. He's only went out to have a great uh, pro, an all-pro career uh, as a defensive back with the Cardinals. So, um so maybe Oregon State could help. Look, if if these guys, one of them goes out and plays brilliantly, both of the games, and they get their team in the college football playoff, it's, which is basically what an Oregon-Washington game is going to be, uh, a playoff quarterfinal. Right. It's, it's, that's going to make it really tough. But but we saw Penix. Penix was a you know an overwhelming favorite. You know, going into the Arizona State game, and they mm-hmm. just had a real clunk. He had a very pedestrian, no t- it, it, no touchdown pass. Yeah, to and that allowed yeah. every, everyone else everyone else to kind of to catch up and now in Nick's case pass him in terms of the, the odds but it's going to be it's going to be interesting as, as we talked before we went on the air some, some voters will vote before the voting will open before the championship weekend and it closes the Monday after on Monday the 4th and then we'll hear who the four finalists are who are invited to New York um, uh, some voters will vote before those games they can have their minds made up and a, a lot of voters myself certainly will wait and, and see what those uh, performances are like I think I know who I'm going to vote for at number one, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, I, my my mind's kind of made up at, at this point. But you, but you still have to go through it and see what could happen, because you know anything could happen, like like the hit by Dallas Turner um, uh, in the Alabama just, game. Just to uh, just to reset everything, uh, Michael Penix, uh, three hundred uh, excuse me, three thousand five hundred thirty three yards passing, twenty eight touchdowns, seven interceptions, minus twenty seven yards rushing. Uh, Bo Nix, 3,135 yards passing. He's sixth in the nation. Penix leads the nation uh, mm-hmm. in passing, 3,533 yards. Bo Nix has uh, 3,135 yards passing, sixth in the nation, 29 touchdowns, two interceptions. He has rushed for 121 yards. Jaden Daniels, 3,164 yards passing, 30 touchdowns, four interceptions, 918 yards rushing, and eight touchdowns. So that's, uh, as you mentioned, that's the that's the dimension that nobody else has. Uh, this is the LSU Sports Insider Podcast brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate and NOLA.com and The Times Picayune. Uh, we are here every Monday and Thursday on all our social channels, our YouTube channels, specifically LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. Uh, you can catch us live, as I say, but if uh, if you if you don't catch us live, you can catch us uh, later on in those same channels. Uh, subscribe to The Advocate, if you would, please, uh, if you haven't already. To do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. That's theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, and there's plenty of news going on, not just LSU football, not just Heisman Trophy related. Obviously, the LSU women are off and running. The LSU men are off and running, sort of. The LSU baseball team will be coming up here uh, at some point at some point soon. And so there's plenty of headlines to, uh, to, uh, to occupy your time and uh, stay, up, uh, stay up to date with all of them. You can sign up for our LSU newsletter. To do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. That's theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Also, if you, uh, if you don't catch this uh, podcast uh, on your phone, you can. You can go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, we are brought to you, uh, incidentally, by Champion Wealth Strategies. To learn more, uh, please go to championwealthstrategies.com. We certainly appreciate them being aboard. Um, we will uh, we will move on just a little bit. I, I do want to uh, just get into you know <laughs> I think at this point in the season we've all sort of decided okay the LSU defense is going to be what they are right. Uh, but I do want to bring up just sort of it, was there anything the, that stood out to you guys about the LSU defense? Is there anything they can do in these last final games? Anything you'd like to see out of the LSU defense? And, and Rab, I'll let you go first. Uh, just. Yeah, the, the numbers get even a little bit worse. Yes. <laughs> the Florida game, you know, uh, the, the, a few more yards per game uh, allowed. Uh, it's 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 a pretty close race between Jaden Daniels' total offense numbers and LSU's total defense oh, yards yeah. really allowed oh, pretty bad. Uh, but for the season. Uh, no, they're they're not going to be much better. And, and, and but you know, it's a play like when they forced the fumble from from uh, Graham Mertz. And it didn't lead to anything, strangely enough. It didn't lead to anything for the LSU offense as well as they did on, on that possession. Uh, they got stopped on fourth down. But it, with those kind of things. And, and, and uh, after they went behind uh, 28-24, they, they gave up only one touchdown the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> only one touchdown. So mm-hmm. yeah, there was some – because it was a back-and-forth game. And finally, Florida just – 
just, they just couldn't keep up anymore, and, and LSU we have pulled away at the end. So that's about the best you can afford. The Georgia State, they're going to be outclassed by LSU. Maybe LSU gives up 24 points or something like that. It's not going to matter. Then you have Texas A&M, and we don't know what their situation is like, you know, how motivated they're going to be or anything like that. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, their offense has been shaky at times at best with Max Johnson. Did, did he get hurt? Did he even play this week, Max Johnson? Uh, I, he, didn't, I, he didn't play. He didn't play. Okay. Yeah, they, oh, they put a, a guy out there who was pretending to be him in pregame warm-ups. That, 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 yes. was, that was bizarre. That's how you know you're in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, and then, they're gonna, of course, they're going to have a bowl game, and, and we'll see you know, who plays and who's out, who opts out, and, and Mekhi Wingo will come back and all this stuff. So, But, yeah, they're pretty much what they, what they are at this point. It, it, how they do against Georgia State this week, certainly it's not going to change your impressions of uh, defenses giving up for 400 yards a game. Reed, was there anybody, any individual performances where you saw, you know, hey, look, they obviously aren't going to get nominated for All-American, but maybe they maybe you look at him and say, hey, that guy had a pretty nice night, and he's got some potential going down the road. Harold Perkins had a nice night, uh, the strip sack. Yeah. Uh, LSU didn't recover, um, but that that might have been you know one of the bigger plays. Also, Braden Swinson, who actually forced the fumble, he did a great job beating that left tackle with a, a nice little spin move. I think it was really Parrish and uh, yeah, yeah Parrish had a couple of nice as well. He had that deflection. Yeah. So, but the Swinson play was really was really strong. Was really good. He used his leverage to sort of spin around that left tackle and then poke the ball free. So you know that's. That's all the LSU defense needed to do. You know, three stops, I guess, and it's all it, all it took for for the LSU offense to uh, to break away. You know, so it's just it, they are who they are at this point. It's pretty disappointing to see just how good LSU's offense is and how good Jaden is. And if just the defense were just a little bit better, you just have to wonder. You're talking about a, a contending team, right? Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah they they would have. They, yeah, they scored 49 points at Ole Miss. That should be enough to win an SEC game, e- even on the road, obviously. Right. And then you come down to the Florida State game and the Alabama game. If they could have you know, played a little better defensively in one of those games, especially in the second half of I, FSU, I, maybe, yeah. maybe, they, maybe they're, they have one loss and they're still in the hunt you know, for everything. FSU, they could have played better against FSU. I just, it just felt to me like, hey, it's not your night. You know, you're gonna, it's so maybe they lose that game, maybe they don't. But, yes, if they had, play, if they had just been able to Yeah, they're going to have at least one of those against those two teams. Right, so that could be both of them. Right, I, if they'd I, have been able to stop the run on, at on all at Alabama, maybe you can talk about a different I will, outcome. I will say this for LSU. At this point in the season, the 7-3 and three, and they're 15th in the polls. We're going to see how they're on the college football rankings tomorrow. A little carnage, and they can slip into the, a New Year's Six Bowl, you know, which is not what everyone's aiming oh. for or anything like that. But um, I, uh, they could get mm. they could get up there. They, Louisville loses. Uh, I admire your optimism. <laughs> Ole, Ole, you know, I'll put Ole Miss, it to you like that. Uh, Ole Miss loses the Egg Bowl. No, I, I think there's um, a distinct possibility you're going to be spending your holidays in Charlotte or, or Nashville well, or someplace like that. I'd like to see if I, if I, that news six. I'd like to see LSU play the old Notre Dame in Tampa in the Reliant Quest Bowl. Yeah, okay. That's what I would like to see. Well, or well, the Gator Bowl in Jack. Bush Gardens is closed. Sorry. Let's get this thing back on track. I, I understand you want to see that. I just I don't know. I mean, and I understand that both of those fan bases would be fired up to see that. I just I, I don't b- believe me. I'm going to be watching every single bowl from start to finish because I'm a sicko. But I just don't know. I don't know what that. I don't know how big a deal it, the bowls are anymore. I don't know how much of an impact they have on the season. You know, the next season and everything like that. So. Uh, you know, we'll we'll get to bowl season when we get to bowl season, and I'll watch along. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put too much, you know, frankly, to put too much stock in anything I see in that game. So if this was next year, you would say we'd be talking you, about LSU would, still having a shot at the playoffs. That's though. correct, and that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. And uh, I think everybody's looking forward to that. By the way, just just a sort of a random thought that I had: how, how crazy? I mean, you know, campus has been on fi- campus was on fire for some of these games the last couple of years. Uh, at LSU, the home games. Can you imagine if and when if LSU ever plays a first round playoff game at home? What kind of what kind of environment that would be like? It's just something to think about. I just, I, I I hope I get to see that one day. Yeah, and you bring in a, you bring in a, a Michigan or a Penn State. Man, you think people or, wouldn't be or Oregon or someone yeah. like that to play? Yeah, yeah. My that, favorite my favorite part of the expanded playoff playoff games on campus. Yeah, my oh, favorite part. I think it'll be I think it'll be crazy. I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch. Well, there was one other thing about the LSU offense that I thought we would you know we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up, which is and I think it says frankly everything it says everything there is to say about Jaden Daniels and what he's doing is that we're sort of over 
overlooking Malik Neighbors, which is insane to think about. Malik Neighbors, guys, has got a real, real chance to win the win the Bolitnikoff Award, best receiver in the nation. 132 yards right. receiving against Florida. He's got 1,284 yards this season. He leads the nation. Is there anything just in general that you guys – uh, are just sort of any anything any comment you'd like to make about Malik Neighbors the season he's had what stands out to you most about him anything in general rap a uh, thing about me is obviously people know how dangerous he is and he still manages to get so open so often it's like kind of like Michael Thomas in his prime w- with the Saints and with you know and Drew Brees throwing to him it's like you know they're going to go for him and you know they're, they're going to bracket him and of course now it's more, it's more difficult because of Brian Thomas's play this year and, he's Ky- still, and Kyron Lacey and, and Kyron Mason Lacey Taylor. has come up and Mason you know and, 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 and but Brian leads the nation and still leads the nation in touchdown receptions right um, one more than Marvin Harrison but his his yeah his yardage numbers are way beyond Mar- Mar- Marvin Harrison Harrison's this, this year, and Marvin Harrison doesn't have to really share as much of the limelight with another with another receiver. I, Thomas is such a great deep threat, but but uh, Malik uh, Thomas is the deep threat, and Malik uh, to me is you know the run after the catch, you know you know kind mm-hmm. of guy, and, and just uh, just his ability to 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 beat coverages that you know are angled to 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 stop him is, is the part that you know it's a little beyond my my football intellect to, to see how he does it but but he's it's impressive you know they're doing it and it's impressive to watch I, I would say this he had i don't have this in front of me but he had 132 yards against florida it was something like 90 of them were after the catch which right. is pretty incredible read anything about about about, about my late neighbors that really stands out to when you. you when you combine that after the catch ability with his ability to grab contested catches yeah. I, I think that's one underrated part of his game just how he how he can uh, come down with catches with a defender draped over him and come down with those contested catches he's been super impressive in that regard as well I think Malik, just overall, he's a super intelligent guy. He's mm-hmm. a super intelligent receiver. He can play anywhere on the field. LSU motions him. They put him outside. They put him in the slot. Doesn't matter. He, he'll run the right route. He'll find the soft spots in the zone. And he'll beat man coverage as well from any spot on the field. So he's got that aspect to him, just the intelligence. And he, he's talked with, with us, with, with the media before, just about how pre-snap he and Jaden are always on the same page, how they can always see – you know, based on the the alignment of the defense, what route is going to work? How they want to run the route and how they want to time it up um, to beat that to, to beat that coverage. And so, I think if you just if you just like talk to talk to him about football, it's, it's why I think NFL scouts are pretty pretty much going to fall, fall in love fall in love with the guy. Yeah. If you just sit down and talk to him about football, he's more than eager to share some of the nitty gritty stuff that goes into receiver play. He, he's just a super intelligent guy, and that's one thing. Um, I, I think people don't really understand about him. It's just his football IQ and how he and Jaden are able to translate that onto the field every week. He 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 did like a five minute whiteboard session with our Wilson Alexander, who's who's not here today, and uh, it, 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 Wilson came back. Just his mind was kind of blown, but he was just yep. taking him through your know, progression. They, they do this, we do this, and this is how we counter that, and it just. He said it was just it was just so fascinating and to to, to Reed's point, yeah, he, he's an excellent student of the game, and obviously that that has served him very well. Uh, I would say the only thing for him in the NFL is that yeah he doesn't have the size. Right, Brian Thomas. If you want to sculpt a wide receiver, that is what you yes. would look like, right. you know, right. an NFL wide receiver. But um, he doesn't ha- he doesn't have the size, and maybe that'll hurt him in the draft a little bit. But but he what he has shown in, in college, especially this season, you can't. Uh, you, you, you can't not be impressed. It will be intriguing. I, I think n- coast to coast, you know, we don't see it. We're not thinking about it as much. But I think coast to coast, it, it, it sure seems like everybody uh, is proclaiming Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, as the best receiver in the nation, almost by acclamation. I wonder uh, if Malik doesn't still have um, – uh, uh, some sort of ground to try to make up against Marvin Harrison in terms of actually being able to win the Bolitnikov. So these next two games uh, may may maybe um, that maybe that's that's one other thing to be looking for in these next two games is if he can really go off either against Georgia State or Texas A and M or both. Uh, that's worth uh, that's worth paying attention to in terms of uh, where he stands in the race for the Bolitnikov. These next two games, incidentally, uh, Georgia State is you know this is this is tomato can weekend in the SEC where we've only got three games involving two conference teams. You know three two, three games that are three conference three games. Conference yeah. games. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the rest of them are you know Alabama's playing Chattanooga. It's that it's that week. It's the second to last week of the regular season, and we know what that means in the SEC. 
uh, the last week of the regular season, LSU will welcome Texas A&M into Tiger Stadium. They won't welcome everyone from Texas A&M. No, they won't. <laughs> the Aggies fired Jimbo Fisher uh, on Sunday. Um, it's maybe surprising only in its timing and maybe surprising only, only uh, given the notion that even for a well-heeled uh, group of boosters like Texas A&M's, uh, it, it was, I think it was in quite, it was fair to say it was in question whether they would actually, you know, do the deed this year and say, we've, we, we can't do this anymore. We've had enough of Jimbo Fisher and choose to pay his $75 million buyout. Um, I, I would ask you first, Rab, just what, why, why didn't it work at Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher? And then if you'd like to, you know, this is our favorite thing to do is go up and down the shopping list and see who you think that they, uh, they might take a shot at. Why didn't it work for Jim, Jimbo Fisher? I think, I think the biggest thing is that he went from someone who was a cutting edge offensive mind uh, when he was at LSU as offensive coordinator under Nick Saban and under Les Miles mm-hmm. and uh, you know, his years at Florida State with, with Jameis Winston. And, uh, you know, we'll never know how much, I guess we'll never really, it's a matter of debate, how much Jameis, you know, gets credit, his, his, his ability. Uh, you know, he won the Heisman that year. They won the national title. You know, how much that, that counts? Because they did have a, a couple of great seasons before him. You yes. Know. Uh, I can't remember the quarterback thing. But, but he just went from that to someone who yeah, clearly had kind of fallen behind the times. Their, their offense looked, you know, stale. Brought in, brought in Bobby Petrino this year. It hasn't really helped. Now, now they've had the quarterback injuries and, you know, the issues, too, to deal with. But... Um, just seems like he kind of kind of fell behind the times, and he was very you know very stubborn, not willing to to change. Uh, like I said I, I, before, I think that one of the things you have to laud a coach like Brian Kelly, who's been at it so long, is that he's been willing to change and be relevant. Thirty two and older. This, the and offense older he's running are, now is not the same offense he was running in the early. No, 90s. and and they're number one in the country in total right. offense. You know, so it, it's obviously a lot on the players, but it's also you know the plays you're calling and and the the attitude you have to have. You know, for uh, for it. So. Um, who who could they get? Obviously, you would think they're going to try to go for a, a big name. Yeah, Dan Lanning's name will come up. Lane Kiffin's name will come up. And Dan, Dan Lanning's coach at Oregon who's done a good job. Who I've also heard people say, when Nick Saban retires one day, <laughs> he might be the guy at, right. at Oregon. Um the coach at UTSA, you mentioned Jeff um, Trailer. Jeff Trailer. Yeah, that's probably you know, there's probably be some support for him in state. You know, part of me thinks they'll make a they'll make a great splashy hire. And then part of me thinks. Texas A&M always seems to run with its shoes tied together. You know, they got they got more money than they got more money than than King Solomon, and they, mm-hmm. they just don't they just squander it. You it know, doesn't seem yeah, to come yeah, together. I mean, they they they've spent. You know, and, and let me say, speaking of squandering money, and like a lot of schools have paid big buyouts, and LSU paid Ed Orgeron seventeen million. Seems like tip money by comparison yeah. Yeah. to this. It it. it I have to say, it, it borders on fiscal malfeasance <laughs> to, to pay a coach $75, $76 million, whatever this buyout is. I mean, it's 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 really – I know they got all the money in the world. And you can, people it. can – boosters can pay them money, it's spend money however they demand. want to. They've got, they had the demand to fire them, and they had the, the money supply to, to, to pay up. Well, well, I, it, you, well, we can – both things can be true, I guess, is what I'm your, saying. Your, your, your father was a professor, right? What, what discussions do you think are going on among the faculty at Texas A&M oh, today? Oh, it's going crazy. Right. Sure. Yeah. You know, but, I, you know, but look. But I, no listen. one, no one 100,000 people don't come to watch him give an algebra test, right? I, well, it's right. I mean, it's, yeah. it, 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 is it, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, again, both things can be true. It can be a pretty foolish way to spend a whole lot of money, but... Also, by the same token, this is maybe a sad commentary on our society, but we've decided that this is a priority. We, as a, as a society, have decided that this is a higher priority for lack of, for 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 yeah. better, worse, yeah. good, that's bad. That's why we have a podcast. I, yeah, I, I that's right. That. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's why we're but, gainfully employed. Uh, but they, they, they're, they're, they've become ultra obsessed at Texas A and M. But it's not. I, I got. I'm going to push back and just say it's not just Texas A and M. Oh, it is. SMU, no, it's not just Texas A&M. SMU. They, they, you know, made a deal with the ACC. They're so desperate to get it, get into the ACC. They say, "Look, we will not take a payout for the next. I don't remember if it's ten years or twenty years, yep. just to get into the ACC." Mm-hmm. And then they decided, "Well, we're going to need some money to be able to sort of hold the fort." They went out in less than a week and raised a hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars. It's incredible. The, the I, thing, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what that says about us as a, as a society. But I mean, this is this is the world we're living in, for it, right or wrong. It's football, football, football. And, and yeah. the thing the thing to me is, 
75 million, it's a huge number. It's a mind boggling number. Um, if you break it down, I, I think I've seen details of this everywhere. The athletic did a good job of breaking this down. There, there's about 20 mil, 20 million, 19, 20 million that they have to pay up front to Jimbo. And then the rest of that is going to be spread out over the next eight years. And it's going to be seven, eight million dollars each year for the next eight years. And that money is coming out of their general athletic department budget. Mm -hmm. So that's seven, eight million dollars for a guy to sit on his couch to sit on a beach in Destin on 30A. And that's... It's that's great work if you can get it. Little I know. TV, you know? Yeah. Seven, I don't know your coach again. $7, yeah. $8 million that can't go to the Texas A&M Olympic sport athletes, to, to the other athletes mm -hmm. of the school. That's a huge chunk of their budget just to pay for a guy that's... Their track not, and field program under Pat Henry. You know, yeah. That's not going to be you know. coaching there. So I think that's yeah. the part when you just really think about that buyout money. You, you just have to think about the other athletes at that school. W what could... What could be done with that money? Could it be invested in women's sports at the school? Could it be invested in some of the smaller programs? You could find almost literally an endless amount of things to, to better spend your money. But again, and uh, listen, it's, it is unfortunate. It's disappointing, and it's, it says something about our priorities being screwed up. But, I mean, like, this is for better or worse, good, bad, up, down. This is this is the way it is. This is the nature of football now. Is it is it unhinged? Yes. Uh, but this is where we're at. I'm just thinking it, it, it's such an Aggie kind of situation. It, I, gotta, I gotta make fun of the Aggies a little bit. Remember when they gave him the the, the, the trophy yes. when he first got the 2000, job? 2000, 2000 fill in the blank. blank, blank yeah. Fill in the blank. And you know what it said on the trophy? Someone put a picture of it. It said, uh, uh, to the Division One National Football Championship. Texas A&M does not play for the Division One <laughs> National Football Championship. They play for the CFP National right. Championship, the Division One Championship. That's the FCS Championship. That's what the North Dakota States and the South Texases and the, the, the McNeeses play for. The NCAA, it's, right? The NCAA the, does not run this championship. Like, oh come on, man! I, you guys, you guys just do it to yourselves. See, that's what I'm like thinking. They're gonna hire Bozo the Clown for a coach. No, you know? come on. No, now. yeah, he's come gonna be a rich now. clown. But, I was gonna say, well, yeah, I mean, you. As soon as you said, listen, I, I will. I remember very, very vividly when Alabama fired Mike Shula, and everybody in the universe seemingly they turned him down. And everybody had, was having a lot of fun dancing on Alabama's grave, and then they said, "Watch this." Who did they want to hire, though? First of all, who oh, they first wanted to hire Richard Rodriguez. Richard Rodriguez. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. look, I, and and that would have been Who's certainly not Where's as good. He at? Yeah, Jacksonville State. Jacksonville or? State. Yeah, that that would not have been a strong hire. But all I'm saying is. Make fun of the Aggies all you want. It does not mean that one – we saw it here at LSU. You hire the one right coach, everything changes. And, and you could Absolutely. be dealing with a behemoth, you know, money to spend and a willingness to spend it. Now, all of a sudden, now you're yeah. dealing, with, uh, dealing with a behemoth five, six hours down the road. But this, this, this shows you how desperate they've become. This is still a school that has not won the national championship since 1939, 1939. before World War II. Yes. Uh, so, the, you know, they and, and they've seen Texas come – and Texas is coming in the league. It, it's, it's, I, I think it's got to be fueled, in, at least in part, by this. A hundred percent. They yeah. see Big Brother coming, and they don't have their house in order. And Big Brother does have their house in order, and they said, well, we can't stand for this. Yeah. We got to fix this now. Yeah. And, so, and it, it would be it would be remiss if you didn't point out the the role that LSU kind of played in getting Jimbo's contract to be <laughs> sure. where it was. It's no secret that when LSU hired Brian Kelly, that there were some flirtations going on between LSU and, and Jimbo. Whether whether it was real or not, that was the rumor, and that played a part in Jimbo getting this big new extension at Texas A&M, and, and that's I'll, why the buyout's as well, big as it is. I, I thought that, that that Jimbo got the extension after the 2020 season, which is the, you know they won they went nine no, was, and one or whatever. It was 2021. Okay, yeah. it was right, right after LSU hired and, and, fired O. And in 2016, when they're looking to replace Les Miles, obviously he was a prominent candidate. So uh, let me ask y'all a question. They, they, they had a chance to hire Jimbo Fisher. The, they kept putting, Jimmy Sexton kept pushing up the price, so they, right. they walked away. Tom Herman, the original, and they ended up hiring Ed Orgeron. Did they make the, did LSU actually, and they fired Ed Orgeron, but did they actually make the right hire? You have to say they did because without, without so. having hired Ed Orgeron, you do not have the 2019 season. You don't. Yeah. yeah. And and it was, you know. Yeah, zero guarantee could, could, that Jimbo or Herman could have done they, that. They, they yeah. would not have. Listen, yeah. I, listen, everybody forgets this about Jimbo Fisher at Florida State. And this is why it's easy to say this now, I know. But it was I was a little bit skeptical of the the plausibility mm -hmm. of Jimbo Fisher and Texas A&M working out the way everybody thought it might work out, which is a national championship and top ten year after year. Because everybody has sort of forgotten about this. 
Jimbo Fisher was not running a smooth program by the end of his tenure at Florida State. The last year he was there, they had to reschedule a game against Louisiana Monroe just to get to six wins. The, the offensive line was an absolute wreck, and if you talk to people over there, they'll tell you that he had sort of pretty much stopped disciplining players. I mean, this was not... You know, maybe you want to call, go back and call this revisionist history and everything, but that, that, he did not leave that program in good shape. And I do, I don't know if Willie Taggart would have ever won there, but I do sort of feel bad for the guy because I think he inherited way more of a mess than everybody, no than, it, than it looked like it was from the outside. Yeah, no, so no question. I'm not, ter- I got to say, I'm not terribly, I, I think we're all shocked and amazed that it, that it was this bad, but I'm not terribly surprised that Jimbo Fisher didn't work out the way everybody thought uh, that it would work out. The conspiracy theorists of conspiracy theorists will say that this was Paul part of Scott Woodward's grand oh, plan. Oh, the plan, yes. He had it all. He, he laid twisting, the booby trap. He was twisting this <laughs> into his mustache and they, I'll make him do this and I'll do that and I'll go back to LSU. He, he's very he's very good at what he does, but I don't know if I'm, gonna, I'm willing to go that far. <laughs> I, I do want to, uh, before we wrap this up, because uh, we're, we're starting to get a little long here, but uh, before we do, I think we would be remiss if we also didn't bring up uh, the LSU women's basketball team. Reed, you cover these yes. uh, these players and these uh, this coaching staff, uh, soup to nuts. Um they obviously uh, they got rocked <laughs> out there in Las Vegas against uh, Colorado, did. losing ninety two to seventy eight, and it came back defeated Queens, uh, defeated Mississippi Valley. Um, were you surprised by what happened out in Las Vegas? And just if you want to give us sort of your two cents on where these guys stand now, I was surprised. Mm-hmm. I, I was very surprised at how Colorado um, really took it to them. But but if you ask Kim Mulkey, she wasn't super surprised. She sort of I guess she could maybe see it coming based on how. Um, she, she expected Colorado to look polished and cohesive because they they made it to the Sweet 16 last year. They returned all their players. So I don't think Kim Mulkey was super surprised at what happened, but I certainly was. And I think a lot of fans um, certainly were surprised at how really poor LSU looked defensively. I think they struggled really to, to stop uh, dribble penetration. They struggled to defend in transition. They, they struggled to defend along the three-point line. Frida Foreman uh, just went off 27 points. She had like seven of 10 threes, I think. Um, and they also got bullied in the paint. Um, Erin Ed she, she was she was awesome down low, and LSU really didn't have an answer for her down low. And I think what, what we learned from that game, I guess, for all the talent that LSU does have, it doesn't right now at this moment, it doesn't have a Ladesha Williams type of player. It doesn't have that experience down low in that big long uh physical presence down low to protect the rim and and hang with those uh the the post players down low okay we will wrap it up there we will uh obviously come back on thursday and uh discuss more Jaden daniels more heisman trophy race more lsu women's more lsu men's basketball more baseball if it's there in the offing uh we'll be here every monday and thursday to do just that uh, you can always catch us on our youtube channels uh you can catch us live on monday and thursday but if you don't catch us then you can always catch us later on on that youtube channel uh specifically lsu tigers at nola.com channel uh we are here every monday and thursday uh we are brought to you by champion wealth strategies Uh, To learn more, please go to championwealthstrategies.com. We appreciate them being aboard. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, And please, uh, if you would, uh, subscribe to The Advocate if you don't already uh, with our print edition or with our digital editions. Uh, To do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. That's theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, and please get a hold of our newsletter. Uh, certainly, as we go down the road throughout the spring, uh, these guys will be here uh, bringing you the latest and greatest uh, LSU headlines, whether it's LSU women's basketball, men's basketball, baseball, gymnastics, what have you. So uh, it's uh, it's a daily newsletter, but uh, Rab handles that three times a week. So uh, so please sign up. It's uh, You can do that at theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. That's theadvocate.com slash LSU. LSU newsletter. For Reed Darcy and for uh, Scott Rabelais, uh, my name is Perrin Keyes. This has been the LSU Sports Insider.